Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Adam RPG with me, Bring It On. Let's read book Sign of Honor, Skobov MY. Sign of Honor from the Analex Comrade Labor by Skobov MY. Publishing House Crash Core, 1968. The golden disk of the generous August sun slowly descended into the golden field of rye. Sveklov, a college student by trade, who traded the summer's rest for labor, stood near the freshly gathered crop and looked at the sunset with a twinkle in his eye and a light smile on his dry lips. Oh, how he loved these rural sunsets. Not because they were ti the time to rest, not even because of the cooling breeze which came after the burning hotness of the day to, plant in, to play in his sunburnt, straw-colored hair. Sveklov was never afraid of labor. He enjoyed any type of weather. He loved the time of sunset because of the feeling of fulfillment after a hard day's work. The sense filled him whole became the only thing he really felt, apart from the slight aching of his tired muscles, and the happiness of labor that brightened and transformed his surroundings into something beautiful. In reality, nothing that Zveklov had here on the farm was too luxurious. The barn in which he spent his nights with other seasonal laborers had rough hay beds, thin walls, and a rusty sink. But this feeling Zveklov got after working in the fields made even those simple things shine. Happiness and fulfillment from work changed the simple commodities, like a pinch of salt changes the taste of a dish. With it, the hay beds became soft mattresses, and water from the rusty tap became an invigorating balm. Even the simple rustic food, brought by old lady Galena, uh, became highly appetizing. Even the tuneless songs the workers sang became heartwarming. Even the old jokes they shared became hilarious. Even the casual talks they had with each starry night near the fire became uh, touching discussions when spiced up with a day of hard work in the fields. Tonight, like Sveklov just heard, one of such talks already had been started by a few of his comrades that were sitting on the porch of the barn. I cut, your hand, cut yourself with a hand cycle, huh? That's not too bad. Nally spoke the 57-year-old Nikitin. Nikitin? As uh, strong as an ox despite his age. Anyone can cut himself with a sickle. Well, anyone inexperienced enough, like a child. Now a scythe, now a scythe is a different beastie, boys. It cuts much deeper. It can even sometimes get the most hardened folks. Uh, anyone who works with it without concentrating on the labor will lose a foot. If not the first time, then the second. That's just what happens. Yeah, I've always been very cautious around scythes. Ever since I was a lad, said the black-haired Habibulin, unknowingly. After speaking his piece, he dipped his boiled egg into a salt pile and ate it whole. A thin and willowy, Sveklov, Sveklov sat near the men, taking a brightly emerald cucumber and some salt. He also started to eat while listening to the, in on the chat. You fear a scythe, guys. What will you do after I tell you about my old diesel mower? The great leader Ivanov inserted himself into the conversation. And his deep blue stare shone the specks of good humor. After clearing his throat and stretching his legs, the great leader rolled one of his pant legs. All three men at once saw a thin white scar crossing his suntanned shin. The mower's blade broke on a stone, you know, and all the little pieces of it shot around like shrapnel. Ivanov laughed. And one of the shards went right into my leg. Happened a long time ago, too. Before the war, that's right. And see how the white scar, or how white the scar still is. Looks just like new. Some bad luck to be sure, nodded Habibu Habibulin. I have a similar scar myself, although mine is from real shrapnel. That said, Habibulin rolled up his shirt sleeve displayed a group of pinkish-white streaks on his tan skin. Got it in the summer of 42. Uh, where did it happen, Odar? asked uh, Nikitin while watching uh, Habibulin scars. The defense of Lenino. A uh, Lenino. Len no, Le Lenino, yeah. Answered Habibu Habibulin, not noticing how mournful Zveklov started to look when the topic of the discussion changed to scars of war. I got something like that in 41, near Moscow, coughed Nikitin. Without wasting any time, pulled up his sleeveless shirt, bearing a wide chest, and a large pink scar across it from shoulder to stomach. An artillery shell exploded just a few feet away from me. Yep. They said I was lucky to survive. Didn't get any help with it, too. Washed it, sewed it shut it with my own hands, and let it heal on its own, after lying a day in the trenches. That's why it looks so crooked, too. My wife, Marusia, got so horrified when I showed it to her after the war. She couldn't even look at it, even though she loved me a lot. A shame. What happened to the saying? Scars make a man? Svab grade leader Ivanov. Some do make men, I guess. But some. Some are just messy. Ugly, mumbled Nikitin. Ah, uh, you know what, guys? Despite that, I never trade any of my scratches away. I have this large, ugly one. 
You know why? The man's face suddenly became very serious. Because I got them for doing the right thing. I may not be as attractive to women as I could have been, he laughed. What I did to earn such that huge scar was more important than any wench. The same goes for all of your scars too. Ain't that right, boys? That's right, uh, Grigory Petrovich, nodded Habib Yulin. What we did for the world back then, back in the war, was... was... I can't even say it. It was like... He quieted down without finding the right words to describe what he was feeling. Yep, Ivanov agreed, somehow understanding what Habib Yulin meant to say. Darn right, Nikitin said. I'm... Ivanov, who was quiet all this time, suddenly stood up. I'm gonna go now, men. I think... I think some hay needs loading. The boy said it without looking at his comrades, and went away with a speedy gait. Half-eaten cucumber was left in the dust beside him, laying on a large leaf of roadside burdock. I think they got the names mixed up. I think this is supposed to be Speklov, not Ivanov. Because Ivanov is the brigade leader. Uh, Speklov is the... That's the protagonist of this story. The three remaining men didn't react to his swift departure for a few moments, lost in the weary memories of the war uh, that sped out of them this evening without any warning. The great leader Ivanov was the first to notice that the boy was going so or gone somewhere. His, hate, his gaze traveled around the farm landscape a few moments before noticing the silhouette of Sveklov, almost invisible in the twilight field. Where's the kid going? Nikitin asked his fellows. I said something about the hay needing to be loaded. Don't know why he thinks that. Habibulin shook his shoulders. I'm gonna ask him, guys. Wait here. Ivanov got up and followed Sveklov into the field. Sveklov was just fixing a knot on the pulley hook of the hay loader when Ivanov caught up to him. The boy looked awkward and out of place, slowly doing his day's job on the brink of night, all alone in the field. Oh, what are you doing there, pal? asked the brigade leader, with a smile on his face and in his voice. The boy jumped up slightly, not knowing he was followed. Um, it can probably rain, you know, and the farmers won't like to work wet hay in the grain elevator, and it can get mold too, so, so, um, you don't want hay to get moldy, uh, it can actually start a fire, it'll start, I don't know the exact details, I just know that moldy hay can lead to a fire, it like heats up and starts smoking and can uh, suddenly burst into flame. It's not gonna rain, buddy, Ivanov said knowingly. The village folks say there won't be a day of rain till September, and the weather people support these claims. But you know, still, better safe than sorry, mumbled Sveklov, while continuing to pull the compressed hay block into the harvest tent. I know nothing of the sorts. With a powerful but not all too brutish grasp, Ivanov stopped Sveklov's hand. Speak your mind, buddy. I know you're not that worked up just because you think it will rain. Maybe some of the guys mistreated you or something. You can tell me anything you know. And nobody did anything to me. It's just that... Sveklov licked his lips and suddenly went quiet. Just what? It's just that I can't be part of your company. You know. You... You guys. One of them done something. You just don't want to say it, is that it? Ivanov asked, uh, barely hiding his sly grin. No, Sveklov yelled out. I told you it's not that. These men can't do anything bad to anyone. Why would you even think that they mistreat me? It's just that... They all... And you too... You all fought in the war. That we did. All of us, nodded Ivanov with a smile. Yes, you all did, but I didn't. I was too young to fight in the war. Four years younger than the minimum age to join the effort. The boy sobbed, making his strong but somehow delicate hands into fists. But that's not even a good excuse. Others, even younger than me, found ways to join the Red Army. And I, I stayed with my mother at home. While you guys fought. While, all, while you all got your scars. Won't we'll ever have your scars. I'll never get to do the great and brave things you did to earn them while protecting uh, our future. I'm ashamed to even be near you men. You're decorated heroes. And I'm... I'm just a nobody. A weak kid who isn't fit to be part of your company. Speklov exhaled loudly and lowered his gaze to the ground. So, Ivanov delicately after the boys... Or asked delicately after the boys spilled his heart to him. Where were you during the war? As I said, I stayed with my mother and little sister. I was 11. We worked in the Chelyabinsk defense factory together, while others fought and died for us. Yeah, factory work sure can't be, can't be compared to shooting Nazis, smiled the brigade leader with relief. I know that, bitterly sobbed Sveklov. You know why? Because factory work is more important than shooting Nazis. I've not finished his thought, and without waiting for a reaction, grabbed Sveklov's hand into his. 
Quite the strong arm you've got here, he said with a whistle, while shocked Speklov uh, simply looked at him. Quite a lot of calluses. Where did you get them? Uh, some levers I worked at the factory ammo press were made of sharp pieces of metal. No handles as well, answered Speklov, not understanding why Ivanov decided to speak about his calluses. And why did you work the press, asked Ivanov. To make new ammo for the Mosin rifle, of course, answered Speklov. And here we have your first battle, Ivanov smiled into the youth's face. His deep blue eyes uh, shone with kindness and love. Don't you know where you, where you fought it? Wait, don't you know where you fought it? But you really... Okay, <laughs> sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand the sentence. Don't know where you fought it, but you really did. I just can't point out the location. Because the ammo you made went to all sorts of places, just like the good old Mosin rifle. Oh, that rifle. Where hasn't the old girl been? She preserved Leningrad during the blockade. She fought the enemy on all fronts. The Baltic, the Belarusian, even the Far Eastern. And even after the war, there was no rest for the good old Mosin rifle. Still many enemies of Motherland lurk the lands. Still the ammo you made deals them just punishment. The only flaw with the Mosin rifle is that she can't speak. But if she could, she'd tell us where the battles you've won happened. And I feel there'd be a lot of those. But, but, mumbled Zveklov, surprised and bewildered by Avanov's speech. Hush. Ivanov stopped Speklov with a gesture. Better yet, tell me where did you suffer this here burn? He pointed out a red patch of skin on the youth's wrist. It's a powder burn, answered Ivanov. I got it when trying to light a fire back home, after a shift at the factory. I was making shells at the time, so my clothes were drenched in powder. When I lighted the hearth, uh, the flames jumped on me. So, you also made artillery shells, asked Ivanov with a smile. That's your second battle, my friend. Can't, uh, can't say ex where exactly. But there are many places the shells you made brought victory to our forces. Who knows? Maybe the shells your tired, burnt, wounded hands made fought the enemy under Kirov City, uh, fired from a Kadyusha. Maybe they raged under the enemy's head in Stalingrad. Or maybe they even punished Berlin in the days a cursed Reichstag fell. Oh yes, it is very possible that in the days the Nazi Fuhrer breathed his last breath in May of 45, those shells made a small Russian boy somewhere in Shelyabin Chelyabinsk, uh, wrecked the remainder of his dark empire. These were your battles, my friend. They were even more glorious than any of us had thought. And these are your scars of war. Those burns and calluses, your battle scars, your signs of honor, and I thank you for them. Without saying another word, the brigade leader grabbed young Zveklov's scarred hand into it with his two mighty palms, brought it to his face, and kissed it. The golden disk of the sun was long since hidden. The darkly golden field of rye now stood under twinkling stars. At the campfire near the barn, all four comrades, Zveklov included, sat together, sharing stories, laughing, and eating their simple suppers. Also, I don't think I've looted in here. Whew. Sorry, I didn't mean to yawn right there. Alright. Yeah, this story had a good sentiment to it, I think. I thought my game was going to crash. Whew. As you walk into the tavern, you notice Kovalev, the former head of Ochinoye, sitting at one of the tables. He takes a drink from time to time and strokes his mustache. Seeing you, he invites you over with a gesture. I care to keep me company? There's so little to do nowadays. A uh, sure thing. I need to rest after my journey. How's life? Need any help around here? Comrade Kovalev thinks something over, then begins to speak in a quiet voice. Know what I miss? My car. A good old Moskvich. My little blue Moskvich. You know, before this Ivan Ivanovich visited us, I didn't think it was possible to find a drivable car in our world, but it seems there is room for miracles even in the wasteland. Well, there's lots of cars in the wastes. No miracles needed. That's almost correct. There are trucks. The light passenger cars like Ivan Ivanovich had. Nope. Never seen one after the war. I see. Uh, so what do you want from me? So I was thinking, maybe you could help me out. You're a capable person. Perhaps you've seen a decent car somewhere in your travels. I take a car in any state of disrepair. My hands still remember the tools I used to fix up my old bolt bucket. The village would sure be glad to have a working car on hand. The old man stares longingly at you, hope naked in his eyes. 
I don't know if I can help you, but I'll definitely try. Sure thing. Good luck on your quest. And please tell me as soon as you learn anything. Are you going to pay me? Kovalev shakes his head. I don't have a lot of money. No savings. And now no access to village funds. Even if I could get to it, I'd never use the people's money in that way. Fixing a car. What foolishness. For most folks, a car is nothing but a pretty picture in an old magazine, or a rusted hulk on the side of the road. Kovalev's eyes grow brighter. He slaps himself on the knee, thrilled with a new idea. I've got it. You're a good man. Everyone knows that. Help me out. I'll fix the car and you'll get to use it. If I can get a car to fix, that is. A functioning car is a rare animal these days. Alright, where he said this. Okay, I'll tell you when I learn something new. And I know where we need to go, which is also where we need to go to turn in a quest. Akati is completely immersed in her paperwork. She gazes up slowly and nods to you, though she seems unsure what's going on. Hey, and I'm... uh, here. She shows you the documents with a powerless smile. Working and working all day long. I came uh, to... Yeah, and I came to congratulate you on your victory. Thank you very much. Your words make the girl blush a bit, and she again lowers her gaze to the scattered pile of papers. Uh, can we talk about the village rumors and stuff like that? About the village? Yeah, about the village, eh? Fine. It'd be a good opportunity to check my knowledge. As a leader, I should know about every nook and cranny of the place. It's hard to be the boss in these parts. Katya sighs. It's not easy for sure. I'm always second guessing myself. Mostly I fear that when I finally make a mistake, I won't recognize it. That's why I'm rereading every paper I have here before I put them away. Sounds difficult. Another question. Now ask away, please. What can you say about Ultranoye, now that you're the boss? I say that it looks calm, but that's only surface deep. You can't imagine how much is going on here, really. Old people always double-check whether I have booked the type of funeral they want. Karina is asking about the infrastructure, possibly without knowing the meaning of the word. Heh. <laughs> that woman sure uh, likes to test her leader. Hang in there, Katya. Another question. Uh, what's the hardest thing about leadership? The hardest? Katya chuckles. Understanding Comrade Kovalev's handwriting. A common Mikoyan's is better, and he's a medic. Yes, good handwriting is pretty important. Another question. Heard any interesting rumors? The old folks always tell me of a man who visits our village from time to time, accompanied by his pet pig. That sounds a little odd, but they're actually scared of him. They say he tells them things, things that make them fear the night. They asked me to get Yan to uh, chase him away, but I doubt such measures are needed. I see. Let me ask you something else. Let's use the subject. Okay. Uh, when are you finished for the day? I'd like us to talk someplace private. Katya looks sad. I, um... The girl looks like she's trying to remember a catchy new phrase she learned. I, I hear you. I'm afraid those summer nights sitting alone with my notebook in the tavern are gone. And they're not coming back. Maybe they'll make a comeback for me. Two feelings struggle in Katya's eyes. The debt she owes to the people of her village, and her attraction towards you. She finally lowers her gaze with a shy smile. I would like that. Really, I would. But, um, let me tell you when I'm ready, okay? Fine, let's change the subject. Uh, sure, what would you like to discuss? I'll always enjoy our conversations. Uh, this is why I'm here. Could you possibly lend me some money from the village funds? Katya swallows audibly, and her eyes look grow large. What? What do you mean? It's the people's money. It's not mine to just give away. You don't trust me? I swear my mother's life if it will convince you. What does this have to do with your mom? Swearing an oath won't change anything. I can't give you the money. I won't. Sorry if that was harsh, but that's the end of the matter. Alright, no means no. Let's change the topic. Alright, that's it. 21 experience. really close to leveling up. Alright, now we go to the abandoned factory. Turn in the quest we got for this uh, election in the first place a long time ago.
And also, uh, the car for Kovalev is at the abandoned factory. Weird. A random encounter. It says, really hoping for a combat encounter. It's been a while since we've fought anything. Well, everyone besides Zulbars. Zulbars was in the ring for a while. But it all works out. So the car for Kovalev is over here at this tiny gas station. Right here. So while I'm here, I may as well talk to Dan. No. Let's see to the car first, because I don't remember when the final part of the abandoned factory quest triggers, and I don't want to risk getting caught in that without doing the car first. A lot of mushrooms right there. I don't need them, but good to know that they're there regardless. A nice car. Looks like it can even be fixed. The car looks pretty good, but I won't be able to fix it on my own. Alright. So that triggers the next part of the quest should tell me that I need to... Okay. Now that we know where it's at, I just need to find someone to tow it for us. Which you can use any caravan you come across that has a vehicle. And I think you have to pay them to tow it, though. You also have to hope that you find a caravan with a, a car in it, or a truck. So you notice that all these are closed off now. Everyone is armed and standing outside. Let's wait for my companions to get over here, and then we'll swap their weapons over. Where are they at? Oh, there they are. Alright. Kosoi runs towards you, huffing and puffing and looking over his shoulder, as if he was being chased. When he sees you, he stops dead in his tracks. I don't recommend going into camp right now. Dan and Shishak had a fight recently. We all knew there would be trouble sooner or later. They disrespected each other, and now they're literally at each other's throats. The men's loyalties are also divided. Some continue to follow Dan, some side of the Shishak. Things are calm right now, but I think this is the silence before the storm. Do what you want, but I'm getting out of here. Many a good guy will fall in the upcoming fight, and I'm not going to be any of them. If Dan wins, I'll come back. If not, I won't. Darn, I just know it's going to kick off soon. So things are fine. So things are fine. You're with Dan, but when the crap goes down, you abandon him like a coward. And what's the reason for the feud, though? Nobody tells us grunts at nothing. Some internal debate, I think. Conflicts of interest, that kind of thing. Some say fighting Dan is like fighting the wind, but Shashak is experienced. He wouldn't attempt a coup unless the odds were on his side. That's why I'm getting out. That for your sake, you'll do the same. So if things are fine, you're with Dan. But when the crap goes down, you abandon him like a coward. The man looks uh, towards the horizon again, pensive. Yeah, when you put it that way, it sounds like a pretty scummy thing to do. You're right, brother. Hold on, Dan. Help us on the way. That's much better. And the battle has begun.
So it is better to side with Dan. I think you can actually side with Shishak somehow. Don't quote me on that though, because I don't I don't remember the option appearing. But Dan is the better option in my opinion. Uh, Shishak is a bit of a psychopath, if you remember our conversations with him previously. It sucks I can't look inside the building when I'm not inside it myself. I can't see what's going on. So pretty sure that's Dan right there, so he's he's safe. And pumping out a lot of damage. So I don't think we'll get any experience for this, but we won't um We get a bunch of free loot, so it's a win-win. Member of the factory gang, instead of bandit. Alright, so that's Shishak. He's got Shishak's gun, so that that makes sense. Up, oxygen, blasting our allies. All right, so I, I can't get into the fight here. Those guys shouldn't last another round. That should be it. We got 17 experience. So this is Shishak's gun. What does it do? 8 to 14. Plus 30 lock picking. Here we go. So this replaces the uh, lock picks that we currently have. Thirty. Eight to fourteen. Is it any better? It requires more strength. Five, six, and one, four, five, and two. Now, I notice how Sh Shishak got this uh, Tokarev, but his nickname is scribbled in the grip. It's not better in any way. Unless it has some hidden... I will take it, but... Alexander up with all this equipment. Easy peasy. All 
All right, that should do it for... Oh, wait, there's a thing back here. Don't mind if I do. All right, Dan. That was a jolly fight. You say so. Can I not talk to you now? Also, you notice that uh, Dunya and Sasha were not here. Also, I can replace this now. Uh, where's it at? Boom. So I think I have to leave and come back to reset the factory. But that is the culmination of the factory quest line. If I'm not mistaken. Well, besides going and talking to Dan one more time. Dan nervously taps his foot. When he notices you, he twitches as if a bullet had flown past his head, but quickly regains his composure and addresses you in his usual cold manner. Oh, it's you. Now that's all? Don't you think I deserve a simple thank you at least? Dan unwittingly nods. Ahem, thank you. Are you happy now? Doesn't matter. Yeah, Shashak screwed us over, and now he's dead. But I'm afraid that's not the end of it. What was the reason for your conflict? I've been brewing for some time. Shashek thought I was, quote, unquote, too soft. He was useful, but I was keeping an eye on him. Guess I missed the warning signs. He had accomplices outside the camp? Dan nods in agreement. I'm sure of it. I saw a lot of new faces among his followers. Not my guys. Too bad they all died or ran away. Would have liked to interrogate one of them. The boss pets his mustache like a favorite pet. Listen. I might have another job for you. Sure, but first you could pay me for the these election shenanigans. Oh right, uh, how did it go? It went well. Uh, Katya won. Katya, from what I've heard, she's a smart girl, which means she'll deal. Which means she'll deal with us. We're the only hope in the world, whether Ultranoye likes it or not. Fine, hold on. I'll get your money. Damage trees a hefty envelope from his pocket. Here, four hundred rubles. This job was much easier than the ones before. Dan, you're an honest man. Helped you out with the mutiny and everything. Yet my reward is so little. Dan sighs, without really wanting to, gets out another hundred rubles. Fine, here's more money. But don't ask me for a raise again. Just take it. You take the money and weigh it in your hand. The envelope is nice and heavy. Smiling, you throw it in with the rest of your things. A nice doing business with you. Dwan, Dwan, Dan twirls one end of his mustache and looks at you coldly. Uh, anyway, you were talking about some kind of job. But uh, what was that all about? Like I said, Shashak couldn't be working alone. There were too many outsiders on his side. He could have gotten so many... He could have gotten so many either in Paragon or Krasno. Maybe he got his orders there too. So nothing is concrete, but you have your suspicions. Fine, where should I start looking? That's not an easy question to answer, although it's hard for me to admit, I'm not entirely sure. Go to Paragon and visit the catacombs under Krasno. I'm pretty sure the answer is out there somewhere. Okay, so I think this is new. I think what we just did, uh, the mutiny, was the final quest previously. But he's mentioned the catacombs under Krasno, which weren't in the game last time I played. So I wonder if they expanded this quest line. Or I'm just misremembering. Now hold up a sec. I want to mark these places in case you've never been there before. 
Dan takes your map and circles Paragon again, and Krasno also. After looking at the map again, he hands it back to you. Here. Hmm. Okay. We'll see what I can do. Great. Uh, anything else? Nothing else. See you. Alright. So I'm going to leave the abandoned factory. I will off camera try and find a caravan with a truck so we can uh, do the next part of Kovalev's quest. That's what we should pick up next time if I can find one. Then after that we will go to... I want to go ahead and finish the abandoned factory quest line, so I'll probably go to Krasno and go to the catacombs. I'm willing to bet that's where the uh, next stage of that quest is, since it specifically mentioned the catacombs under Krasno, and they were added later on. Also, I think maybe the truck at the... Is it here? I think there's a truck at the filling station fortress. Maybe that's where it's at. Regardless, I'll look for a truck off camera. And uh, see, that's what we'll pick up next time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.